So my name is David Biet. I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Wilson Center. I, I know most of you already. Um, it's a busy week for us. It's a busy month for us, the Canada Institute here. Um, let me just do some more shameless advertising. Tomorrow, we have Canada Crude to China, Prospects and Barriers of Increasing Chinese Imports of Canadian Oil, or Increasing Exports of Canadian Oil to Asia, however you want to read it. That's from um, 9 to 11.30. Next week, um, Northern Border Crime and Terror, ne terror Networks, Fact or Fiction. Um, that will be on Wednesday at between 9 and 11. Um, later that week, Temporary Migrant Care Worker Programs in Canada and European Union, Models for the United States. That's a program we're working on with a partner here. We're also working with the University of Quebec at Montreal on their Fences and Walls Conference on Tuesday the 17th. So if you happen to be in Montreal and want a good conference, there you go. Um, interesting week in Canada. Um, and I'm going to turn the whole program over to Paul Fraser, um, who is on your far right, um, our left here. Paul is principal of Three Click Solutions, a consulting firm based in Washington. He advises a broad and varied range of private sector and public sector North American and international clients on how best to promote and protect their interests. He covers a wide selection of issue areas including energy, climate and cap and trade, natural resources, health care, trade and trade policy, financial services and border security. A lot of those are Canada-US issues. Um, in uh, January 2010, Fraser was appointed Special Advisor on Canada-U.S. Relations to the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. He is also, I'm proud to say, currently serving as co-chair of the Canada Institute's Advisory Board. Just some housekeeping for, uh, before we go on. Washrooms are all the way down the hall. We are being filmed, not live webcast. The film will be posted later, uh, later in the week or next week. Um, when the microphone comes to you, and please wait for the microphone to ask a question, um, please identify yourself. So with that, let me turn it over to Paul. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Jane, as well. It's great to be at a, uh, an event co-hosted by uh, two such great organizations, which uh, are consistently very active in this town and, uh, and work exceptionally hard to keep abreast of the issues and bring issues before a wider audience. So I welcome the opportunity to be here and also, uh, needless to say, to welcome this uh, stellar panel of, uh, of folks who, in their own right, uh, could give you a very uh, articulate and, uh, and brief rundown and analysis of what uh, just transpired in Canada with respect to the elections. They each bring something very specific to the table, and for today's purposes, I will introduce them individually just before each is to speak. And uh, I, you've all had access to a broader description of their background, so I will just touch on some brief items. And then uh, we want uh, the presentations to be such that they are not just thought-provoking, but in, enable us to engage in some very active uh, conversation. Uh, Tim Powers, uh, to my right, uh, hails from Newfoundland. He is the Vice President of Summa Communications in Ottawa, where he is also uh, on the Faculty of Communications uh, at the University of Ottawa. I mentioned Newfoundland, and uh, for anybody who has any interest in politics, if you're from Newfoundland, it's in your genes, then one of the people you really do have to work with at some point in your life is John Crosby, and that's very much where he began. Uh, he also subsequently uh, had uh, senior positions within the Progressive Conservative Party as Director of Research and Advisor to Research and Policy and Advisor to the Leader. Well, Tim, the Prime Minister has now joined a short list of uh, Prime Ministers who have now won uh, three victories in a row. His is a very substantive victory. Uh, we're interested very much in how you think this victory, where he received 40% of the popular vote, where many observers have keenly noted there are some gaps in his representation, his party's representation in significant parts of the country. How do you think his victory will affect the manner in which he governs, issues of transparency, central control, the need for perhaps more public debate on uh, key government issues. Um, these are some of the items that people talked about during the campaign. We welcome your views on how we got there. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure to be here. Uh, the one thing about working with Mr. Crosby is it does require a good degree of psychotherapy afterwards. So if I start to mumble, that's because I've been pulled back into that realm. Uh, well, what to expect? First of all, the the apocalypse apparently didn't come yesterday when Mr. Harper uh, won. It, it's happening today here in Washington with your wonderful Newfoundland weather. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> The apocalypse 
didn't come uh, and won't come, in my view, uh, as much as Herb and the Liberals have prom been promising it since 2004. Uh, I think, in fact, what you will see, and uh, I'm afraid Ian Brody's here, he's going to grade me afterwards, so uh, I'll try and see what I get in terms of a letter grade, but uh, uh, I think what you have seen is a bit of a natural progression. Historically, we were all intoxicated in Ottawa. It's easy to get drunk on nonsense there. Any of you who've spent any time there on daily tracking polls, uh, suggesting that uh, you know another minority was at hand, and that certainly was a possibility. Uh, at a point, it looked like uh, the, the Liberals would do better than they did, um, and nobody uh, sub expected the NDP to do as well as they did. But I think uh, taking a longer longitudinal view of it, it's probably a bit of a natural historical evolution if you look at patterns of Canadian history that a uh, government that has had two minorities has a better chance than not of either forming a majority or not. Uh, I think in the end, when the election was done, uh, some clear choices were made. Uh, I think uh, Canadians did decide that they did, in part, like the message of stability. They did give the Prime Minister, whether they liked him personally or not, uh, marks for economic competency. Uh, I think he did run uh, a bland, deliberately bland and boring campaign nationally but a very focused and targeted campaign regionally, and that is part of the new Canadian political reality. Uh, I'm sure Antonia will have some very interesting observations about Quebec. I think we made some mistakes in Quebec that are uh, not just uh, portrayed by our whopping four seats, uh, but are uh, endemic of changing a strategy, and then we can discuss that during, uh, during our, uh, our question uh, segment. What was fascinating, perhaps, is and, and was to watch the rise of the NDP. And I note in the assemblance of this panel, nobody expected that. I don't think Herb is going to be a proponent of merger today, and uh, Orange Crush is not something he easily embraces, though you, if you were to read Canadian news clippings now, you would assume that Orange Crush is part of the Canada Food Guide. <laughs> Drink it and you too will lose your mind. Uh, <laughs> greatest respect to my friends in the NDP, though. <laughs> what I do think happened, uh, and I think uh, Ian Brody would probably agree with this, as would others who have watched this as we have since Jack Layton came on the scene. Jack Layton, uh, having very different policy and uh, philosophical and political uh, views than the Prime Minister, took a very similar tact to the Prime Minister. As Stephen Harper was getting the attention and the notoriety, and rightly so, for bringing the Conservative Party together, uh, developing a very sensible uh, approach to garnering seats. Jack Layton was doing exactly the same thing without a lot of attention uh, on the left. When Jack Layton first came to power uh, in 2003, he assembled as well a team of highly dedicated political professionals who set about to rebuild and rebrand the NDP. Harper and Layton went on upward trajectories, although with different degrees of variance uh, from the 2004 campaign onwards. The Liberals went down and down and down, and I won't speak to the Liberals, Herb can do that, uh, but you shouldn't be too surprised by what has happened with the growth of the NDP. They have become, that they're not your father's NDP, as others have said. Uh, Leighton has maintained a key professional core. Now, uh, many of his candidates uh, will make for interesting members of parliament, but all parties have interesting members of parliament who have colorful and unique pasts. Uh, Jack Layton just has more of them. Uh, he's got the tattoo artists and the bar managers, uh, but he's got four and years. Students? And nope. students, and Karate students experts. are wonderful things. Not that Karate experts. with tattoo artists. Well, I'm not going to show you my tattoo right now. Uh, so, so, Scotty, that says I love Steve, uh, I'll, shave, I'll, show, I'll save that for later. Uh, but the, the point being, um, the intensity of the Leighton rise was surprising. The fact that they rose wasn't. Uh, talking to people before the campaign in the Leighton uh, organization, they thought they could have a shot at 50. Uh, obviously, things happen in Quebec that Antonio is more capable of explaining than I that propelled them. Um, well over that mark, but if you take the Quebec numbers out uh, or, or reduce them significantly, they do get around 50. Um, Newfoundlanders should never try to explain Quebec because Antonio and I will end up in a fist fight and we'll get into Lower Churchill, but I do want to get to that quickly and then, <laughs> and, and then move to, uh, to what it means. Uh, Harper's majority, I think, to understand it and what it may mean forecasting forward. 
Stephen Harper came to power uh, in part by uh, doing things people assumed he wouldn't do. They, they read the critique of his critics, which uh, was to suggest he was not pragmatic, not incremental, uh, was simply going to destroy Canadian society as we know it. His success has been playing against that type. Uh, I think to view the Harper majority going forward, you have to view it with this as the guiding premise, that Stephen Harper wants to leave the Conservative Party, uh, and in turn, he wants to leave his government in better shape than he left it. Uh, he is an intense student of history and political science, and he well knows that Conservative parties uh, can unwind faster than uh, Michael Ignatieff's rise up, rise up speech. <laughs> he is well acquainted with that. He knows that. Um, he's a accomplished three things which I think are notable now, but I think he wants to accomplish something else, and then I'll move on to Herb. Obviously, the unification of the right is a huge uh, s s uh, historical legacy issue, something that he will, along with Peter McKay and others, uh, justifiably be proud of and be noted for. Uh, I think his stewardship of minority parliaments, which often gets forgotten when uh, picking apart and focusing on the uh, distractions, to use the Prime Minister's words, of some of the things that have gone on in the House. You don't govern in a minority situation for five and a half years if you don't have the ability to be both a solid political operator and a, an astute student of the times. The third partial achievement, which he's achieved with Jack Layton, is to knock the Liberals back, though I don't think they're dead and gone. Herb Metcalf's very much alive and he hasn't poked me at the moment, uh, and I think it would be folly to assume that. But it is a significant historical achievement that he and Layton, who've been on the same tact as it has related to bringing down the power and potency of the Liberal Party, have achieved. <laughs> Here's where we are now, and I will finish here. Uh, we're into a whole new phase. Uh, as Ian Brody will tell you, Stephen Harper has been campaigning incessantly since 2002. He's had leadership races, he's had party unifications, he's had four federal elections. He now has the luxury of not having to fight an immediate political campaign for the first time since he has been leader of the Conservative Party. There will be lots of micro campaigns to fight on policy issues and the like as they come forward. But he is now into a phase where I would suggest to you uh, he's looking at what his sustaining historical accomplishments may be on a policy front. Uh, I think as it relates to Canada-U.S. relations, um, in particular, um, and Ian will remember it, he was there then, uh, the super, Canada's a, an energy superpower. Go back to a speech he made in London in 2006. Um, I think uh, the enhancement of trade uh, and trade liberalization, uh, changing our relationship or lessening our dependency with the United States. If Stephen Harper gets a trade agreement with India, that's a huge accomplishment. Uh, I think he also, and I'd love to hear Antonio's comments on this because this will be a challenge in the next four years, wants to ensure that his federation uh, is functioning and being productive and being empowered, but allowing the members of the Federation to do that. And I will end, I promise now, with this point, because I must pander to my home province. One of the most significant things I think the Prime Minister did from a policy perspective that has a direct correlation to the United States uh, and our relationship with it during the campaign, and he took some significant heat in Quebec for it, was the promise to do something significant related to the lower Churchill uh, hydroelectric project in Quebec. That's not just important for Newfoundland and Labrador. If that thing comes to fruition in the manner in which it could, it has the ability to lift an entire region up to a complete have status and empower that region economically and do it in a manner, in a policy making manner that uh, is enabling as opposed to destabilizing. It's not the, na it's the National Energy Program in reverse, arguably. Uh, and that's one of the things I would suggest to you to look at how the Prime Minister will want to work with the provinces to enable them. The very, very last point, Paul, sorry, is this. 
that he, uh, he will also want to have as part of his achievement, I think, over the next four years, because he is a conservative, uh, because he is uh, described and is a, an economist, he will want to rein that deficit in. He will not, as I say, uh, want to leave office um, saddling his successor uh, with, uh, with deficits, and again, he will want to leave the party and the country in a better place than he found it. Thank you. Tim, thank you very, very much. Uh, you raise a number of very interesting points, one of which is the reference to his federation, and I hope we'll be able to come back to that, and this whole notion of enabling regions, which uh, I think is significant going forward. I'd now like to uh, introduce Herb Metcalf, who is known by many of you in this room. He's known certainly very well in Ottawa and elsewhere in Canada, very much as a go-to specialist in government relations. In Ottawa, he is president and co-founder of the Capitol Hill Group, uh, but he comes to us today as well as someone who has held uh, various positions within the Liberal Party. He was chair of uh, John Manley's leadership campaign. He was senior advisor to the uh, leadership campaign of Stéphane Dion. And perhaps more noteworthy, he also was revenue chair of the Liberal Party. I suspect he may be called back uh, or pass the hat later today, uh, Herb. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, with the Canadian dollar worth more than the American, there's not really any money in this room that you want, uh, you want to pick up. The more here, then. Exactly. <laughs> the, um, the Liberal Party, Herb, is uh, very much uh, as part of your makeup as uh, the Conservative Party is for Tim, I suggest. And we all know the, the kind of setback that the Liberals have now had this week. And, um, Nothing uh, before for the party has been as dramatic or perhaps as significant. And of course, it begs the question of, uh, of what now, beyond leadership, uh, issues of realignment, uh, certainly rethinking. Uh, we welcome your thoughts today on uh, what has just uh, transpired. Thanks, Paul. It's always good to sit beside my good friend Tim Powers. Uh, we've been around Ottawa for a long time together, and even though we, uh, we uh, have different uh, political stripes, I have a lot of respect for, uh, for Tom. And Tim, I should say Tim. Tom, yeah. <laughs> and I just gave you five dollars. <laughs> if you could just get to know him yeah, better. Yeah. Well, I was so I was so shocked. Taken aback, but I donated. Yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, if you make it uh, 150, I have to get your receipts. <laughs> Anyways, um, it was quite an election. Uh, I think the Liberals have learned one good lesson: is that uh, I don't think the next leader of the Liberal Party of Canada will be a ex uh, professor of of anything, so, <laughs> sorry, yeah, <it's> only up. <laughs> I think we've, uh, we've done that road twice, and uh, from my own personal experience, it, uh, it, uh, the, the problem is, is, is that uh, in both cases, uh, both leaders uh, felt that they were the smartest person in the room, and it's very hard to give someone like that advice, because it can't be right, because they didn't think about it, and they, it wasn't their solution, so, uh, I remember sitting in a meeting. Harsh. Harsh. Dude. <laughs> well, I mean, it's supposed to be open and honest, and I'm not hearing Are you Tim. Are not sunny here now? <laughs> What's that? It's hard to go home. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube video will be up after. <laughs> <don't worry. laughs> That's right. So anyways, you know, it was quite an election. I mean, it started off as being very boring and that, and people called it policy light, and then everybody was stayed up on uh, election night to about 2 o'clock uh, uh, Tuesday morning to get the final results, and it became quite exciting. And it was also an election where we have some firsts. I mean, Mr. Harper's first majority government, uh, the NDP, the, the first time they've had the number of people elected to the House of Commons, first time they've been uh, um, uh, uh, opposition. Uh, it's hard to say, I know. I know. <laughs> I keep thinking Her Majesty's loyal opposition is thinking liberal. Um, Elizabeth May is the first member of the Green Party uh, to get elected. And for the first time, the Liberals occupy a, a place in the spectrum that they never had before, which is uh, third-party status. And there are a lot of people that are uh, having a problem with that. Um, the Liberal Party, the strategy, well, the strategy was to win, but that didn't work, uh, obviously. Um, they wanted, there was a belief that if we exposed and let Canadians see uh, uh, Michael Ignatieff up, up close, that Canadians would turn around and they would forget the negative image that the conservative ads had created of him, and they would swarm to him and give him a majority government. And um, so the first part was to, to turn this image around. And he, for the most part, he had, you know, the first two weeks were really good. He was out, he was went to daycares, he sat down with little four-year-olds, 
drew circles and it was good. He didn't sort of vomit. And um, the uh, <laughs> Maybe he could become a daycare person. Hey, listen, he's <laughs> looking for a job. He wants to teach. He I mean, you know. And uh, he was out glad handing with large crowds. And, you know, the proverbial wheels stayed on the bus. And then I think people got shocked. The money came in despite, uh, despite the uh, feeling that it didn't. We raised more money in the first uh, 20 days of the campaign than the party had raised in the last two elections. So uh, despite the $5 uh, I was just given. Um, and so this continued. And, uh, but as much as you can plan and organize such encounters, opportunities for making connections uh, with people and voters, uh, which is all us politicals like to do, is an organic process. And either it works or it doesn't. And he wasn't able to grow that support outside the Liberal base. Uh, next came the launch of the platform. And I think even Tim might say that the launch was, was, was better than anybody had uh, anticipated. We, uh, we had a large town hall meeting a meeting that was televised across by the internet uh, and such. People were able to participate with questions from the audience, uh, by Twitter, uh, by internet, and it felt good and the, and the media coverage was really, really good. And it wasn't a bad platform. It was called the Value Pack. If you go to Loblaws, you can get them. It's a store. <laughs> sure, Farmer Care down the street has the va Value Pack and it's where, and it, but it was kind of catchy and it started to roll. The problem was is, is that after he launched it, he didn't talk about it. I mean, you know, he didn't talk about the, the, the student package. He didn't talk about the care for seniors. He got on this kick about democracy, contempt of parliament, ethics, all these great things that we all come to believe in. But nobody during the campaign went to bed and woke up and said, darling, you know, I couldn't sleep a wink last night because I was worried about democracy. Might be worried about the, uh, my mortgage payment, my kids' tuition. I know what that's like. I got a daughter at uh, Adler School of Psychology here. And so, you know, democracy, it's all great. We can talk about it, but nobody's going to change a vote on it. So that sort of came and, and went. And then we had the debate. And the strategy for the debate was to show Canadians that Michael Ignatieff was the best of all three leader, four leaders to lead the country and to put it back on the map. And so he spent his time talking about, you know, $16 billion surplus, how the Tories had now had $55 billion deficit. He went from, he went on about, you know, uh, uh, prisons and jets and, and all that. And not once did he talk about Jack Layton in the, in the debate. And, but he kept being repetitive <coughs> about democracy, ethics, and all this. And at the end of it, um, Jack Layton sat back and listened to this whole diatribe and said, you know, Mr. Ignatieff, <laughs> when people don't show up for work, they don't get, they're not expected to get a promotion. And you, sir, miss 70% of the votes in the House of Commons. And Ignatieff stand, stood there with a, like a deer with its eyes caught in the headlights and just, uh, and then he sort of said, well, you'll never be leader, Jack. And from that time on, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was over. And, uh, you know, it was quite, a, it, was, it was a very good debate. Nine million Canadians watched it. And so, but his, his numbers just tanked after that. The other thing is he became the issue at the door. You know, people, just candidates were phoning in uh, and saying, listen, I mean, you know, the ads were all focused around Michael but he was the issue at the door. And you could just see the support. And the money dried up, which is, you know, my view is the best way to talk, see if you're doing well. The money's pouring in, and it always pours well in, and I imagine it poured in really well in your campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, ours did really well for, like I said, for 20 some days, and then the tap just sort of went out. It was sort of like the Sahara again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, so we, here we are. We uh, come into election day. And in the last two weeks uh, of the campaign, or last 10 days, Ignatieff looked desperate. You know, he was trying to go here, go there, and uh, it just wasn't clicking. In the meantime, Jack uh, hit a home run in the, in the two debates. And I think the, big, the turning point for Jack was that he had a platform that Quebecers liked. And Antonio will speak more about that. But um, 
people in our Montreal office were phoning me saying, you know, he's getting more receptivity. He's got a platform. The problem is that in for Quebec was that Ducep didn't put a platform out. I mean, he had a brochure that had lots of pictures, big print, but didn't really say anything. And Jack had this socialist uh, platform that was 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 being uh, well accepted. The other thing he did is he went on a, a program called Tout Le Monde Parle, and I think it has about, about a million and a half, two million viewers, and he was really, really good. I mean, he talked about his prostate cancer, he was very open, and, and moved into his platform. And that started to, and our, our Quebec candidate started phoning in saying, you know, it's going, you know, I mean, we're losing. I mean, Marcel Pru over in, in Hull, uh, who had, I think that writing's never been anything else but liberal, uh, he was 19 points behind by the third week. Uh, Lawrence Cannon, who was the foreign affairs minister up in Pontiac, uh, Temiskaming, uh, you know, he was trailing a guy who was a karate expert. Like, I mean, it was, I mean no comparison on the quality of people. Uh, Wrong with karate. No. <laughs> Put that in quotation marks. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so elections over, a lot of sad faces, and the, and the unfortunate part is we lost a lot of good people in in the Liberal caucus. We lost a lot of our younger members, and we lost a lot of our women uh, candidates and our women MPs. So we now have only five women MPs in our caucus. Uh, a great lady from uh, Newfoundland, uh, Judy Foot, uh, Judy Scro. No women from Quebec. Uh, Hetty Fry, uh, which I want to trade. We can trade this. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not okay. comment. Not comment. <laughs> and put uh, her on waivers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and Joyce Murray, and uh, who? Uh, and so that's you know compared to what we had before, that's not a uh, not a uh, not a uh, uh, a great place for us to be. So uh, the first step in rebuilding is that uh, Michael Ignatieff announced that he's stepping down uh, and that um, an interim leader will be elected by the caucus next week uh, to start the rebuilding process. I think what our party needs to do, I think the fact that the Conservatives have a majority government is good for them, but it's also good for us. Um, it allows us to not have to be worried about an election in two years or three years. We know when it's going to be. So we now have have to focus on the rebuild. First step is getting in. First step was for Michael to leave. Second step is for the uh, uh, caucus to select an interim leader. And I hope that uh, they decide at that time that they're not going to have a leadership convention for at least two years. Our party, the structure, the infrastructure in it is broken. It needs time to to be fixed properly. Uh, we made. Uh, substantial uh, improvements over the last year on the fundraising side with going out and hiring professional fundraisers, putting in place the infrastructure, building the list, and it was easy to do because these guys had already written the manual on how to do it, you know? So you just copy, but when it works, it works. And, uh, and so that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to change our party from a federation to a party. Uh, we have a situation right now where where the national board is consisted of uh, 16 provincial PTA presidents that have the votes. So the actual executive of the board can never get anything passed. So unless you get all the, and, and the money is split, you know, between the national party and the provincial wings of the party, and it, and it doesn't make for a, a, united, a united party. So that's gotta change. And we have to rebuild the, the, the grassroots of the, the the, uh, I think, you know, going forward, I think uh, from a public policy perspective, it's going to be very good. Mr. Har Mr. Harper is going to be able to, to get his agenda through. People is going to be so, the stability. Uh, the uh, initiatives like the Canada U.S. Perimeter Initiative and on a whole bunch of other issues, uh, investment Canada, uh, foreign investment into Canada, I think all those big issues that are going to help drive our economy are going to get dealt with. Uh, there can be some squawking in the in the house uh, and there will be uh, but when it goes to committee uh, the committees are all now going to have the majority of the members of the committees are going to be government and so uh, these policies will get passed quickly and there won't be the threat of you know are we going to be defeated today or somebody going to make this an opposition uh, motion to defeat the government 
whatever. And so I think for the country, it's good. And, uh, and, and we'll see where the Liberal Party goes. I think the other thing is, is that there's a lot of speculation, will the Liberal Party merge with the NDP? If they do, I'll be knocking on uh, Tim's door uh, with my membership. It'll cost you more than $5, <laughs> <laughs> Take a number. Take a number. Take a number. Uh, uh, and that's probably the way the Liberal Party would split. I'd say, you know, probably 30% would go to the Tories and the rest would go, go with the NDP. So I don't believe there will be that merger to take place. Uh, I do believe that the NDP has some very, very big hills to climb. Uh, they have uh, about 80 new neophyte members of parliament. Uh, some have never been to parliament. Some of them, you know, I mean, one, I, I, I love these stories. I mean, she's a bartender. She took a holiday and went to Vegas, and she comes back, and she's the elected member. So she's gone from making Pay raise. <laughs> Pay raise, you know. We're trying and, to figure out if she knows where it is on the map. Uh, yeah, that's right. And so, and the, but the bigger issue for the NDP is, is going to be that 60% of their caucus comes from Quebec. And so when we get into discussions on national issues, uh, it's going to be very difficult uh, for the Pat Martins of the world to uh, all of a sudden sort of change their positions to accommodate the 60% uh, problem they have in caucus. So I, I think that um, over the next couple of years, what the Liberals have to do is try to capture the center. I think the NDP will implode at some point. And the other thing that I, nobody's talking about is the uh, future health of Jack Layton, who is a very sick person right now. So, and, that's, and he's done a hell of a job running a campaign. This election was more about him than the party and, uh, and that, but those are you know, going forward the issues. But you know, there's four years of stability, so. Herb, thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll be interested in talking further in discussion about some of the demographics uh, with respect to the voting, uh, what we've come to know so far. Uh, also, your comments with respect to uh, the future of the NDP, let alone the Liberal Party, are also uh, something we'd like to get into a bit more. And, and some of that we can do with Professor Antonio Maioni, who, as you know, is uh, the highly regarded director of the Institute for the Study of Canada at McGill University, where she is also Associate uh, Professor of Political Science. In addition to bringing to the table a background in uh, a rich scholarly research, she is also well known to many of you as a, a leading uh, analyst of Canadian political affairs, and most recently that was seen on uh, CTV's uh, broadcast of uh, election night reporting, and just prior to that during the campaign. Uh, CTV being the largest broadcaster in Canada. Antonia, I noted uh, that uh, La Presse described Monday's uh, election results, really the vote as a, a political earthquake with Quebec as its epicenter. Uh, Le Soleil, uh, in similar vein, referred to how the political ground uh, trembled uh, as a result. And Le Devoir reminded us that uh, all those folks uh, who did vote for the NDP this week uh, should not be presumed to be instant Federalists. Uh, they were parking their vote in a different way and decided, I guess, uh, according to Le Devoir, to be part of a game uh, that they'd been isolated from rather than waiting for some particular day when other things might happen. And uh, we welcome your comments right now on implications with respect to Quebec in particular and what happened this week. Thank you, Paul. Though um, I'm, I'm sensing a bit of a bipartisan nature to this panel, uh, I just wanted to tell you that I am not the representative from the NDP. <laughs> Even though four McGill students were elected, two of them who have actually sat in my class, I take no. <laughs> nor am I a representative of the Bloc Québécois, though, not, though I can tell you that my brother-in-law just lost his job as uh, Gilles Deceppe's driver. So uh, I just want to make sure that uh, I'm coming at you, as they say, uh, from a nonpartisan stance rather than my esteemed colleagues. Nothing wrong with being partisan, especially in this town. I want to start with a story. About six weeks ago, uh, Paul mentioned uh, the CTV. Uh, producer of, the, C of uh, the election night broadcast called me. I had done the broadcast in 2008, and he called me and said, we'd like to you know, get our ducks in a row. It looks like there's an election coming up. And so we'd like you to come and comment for, uh, and be there. And I said, you know, it's the end of term, exams, all these things that professors I know 
donkey and we sit in our ivory towers. And he's like, oh, well, you know, it's not going to be a lot to worry about. <laughs> um, Quebec, you know, what, 45 to 50 states are going to go to the block, and so you'll just have to do the stuff on the margins. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, okay, sign me up, Scott. Beam me up, Scotty. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was that. Last Sunday, I was sitting in a windowless room called the CTV boardroom, <laughs> where we were all together, all the people who would be uh, there on election night, all the pollster, Nick Nanos, you know, the, 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 the guy, the computer guys with their, pla their plastic pocket protectors, everyone in the room, and all of a sudden, uh, Monday show was, was going to be a really big show, as they say. Uh, we, the, the reports were coming in that uh, the, the block would collapse, the Liberals have already collapsed, sorry. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the Conservatives were saying the NDP will get 25. So the Conservative, I don't know who your insider is there, but anyway, Bob Fife was talking about Conservatives saying 25 seats for the NDP in Quebec. Um, the block insiders were saying 30-30 split, 30 block, 30 NDP. Then the computer guy said uh, he, he really doesn't care what, you know, all he knows is numbers, right? 48 seats for the NDP in Quebec. And so we, like everyone just spontaneously burst out laughing. Uh, sorry, NDP, yeah. And I just kind of, this, this is funny, you know, all these block seats where they have 20,000 vote majorities were about to turn NDP. So just to say that, you know, six weeks is a really long mm -hmm. time in politics almost like an eternity uh, in terms of what we were expecting. Nobody talked about the results, so maybe I could just go over them, but Tim, you tell me the, in terms of the recounts if I'm, in my, if I'm on the right page. I have 167 seats for the Conservatives. 166. 166? What percentage is, is of 40% of the vote, so they increased their vote percentage by 2%. So it's a huge, um, yeah, I have 167, but. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about a 2% increase in the vote share. Should I repeat that? I'll a two percent increase in the vote share. Just, just as you know, I'm not part nonpartisan. The, the official opposition, which is now the NDP, uh, raised their game by 31 percent of the vote. Right? It is 167. Yeah. The defeated Liberals lost five percent of the vote, and the Bloc Québécois ended up losing about six percent of its vote. So just to put everything in perspective, right? So we're looking at a strong majority. 167, uh, a strong official opposition, 102, a uh, third party called, I think it's the Liberal, Liberal yeah, Party of Canada, Canada, Liberal party of Canada yeah. I think it's called, 34 seats, four seats for the Bloc Québécois, and one seat for the Green Party. So the Green Party makes its entrance into the Canadian uh, House of Commons. But there's two, there's two judicial recounts. And there's, there are two count recounts. One yeah. is a Liberal, isn't it? Two. Two. two both are Liberals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so maybe you'll gain a couple. That's good to know. That's good to know. <laughs> I know that's important for you. So it's Bless your to heart. <laughs> the, the tide turned on Monday night um, with the first result from Quebec. This is the riding of Haute Gaspé, uh, excuse me, Gaspésie les Îles de la Madeleine. And uh, Tim knows about it because it's in Atlantic Canada, almost in Atlantic Canada. It's on Atlantic time, in fact, uh, Îles de la Madeleine. And as goes Atlantic Canada, goes the world, as we know. Uh, so exactly right. The Finally first, glad to hear that. The <laughs> first result comes in. One poll is reporting, so one poll is reporting in Gaspésie et la Madeleine. This, in historical terms, was so red. This was the deepest of the deep red uh, uh, ridings for the Liberal Party until, about, until the 1980s. Um, it was a battle of the titans. It was supposed to be a battle between two mayors, the mayor of Gaspé and the mayor of Paspébiac. And I can say that very quickly, Paspébiac, because we spent our summers in, in the Gaspé. The bloc had won that uh, riding by 5,000 votes in 2008. The, um, the uh, Conservatives were wanted, had, had run this very f good candidate, the mayor of Gaspé, the largest city in the region, to get that away from the bloc. And the NDP, uh, I don't even know who the Liberal candidate was there, but the NDP candidate was a notary public from calatin sur mer which is a tourist uh, town. One poll reporting, the NDP is ahead. I turned to the NDP lady and I said, the orange tsunami, because that was it. Mm -hmm. that, that riding, going to the NDP, signaled everything. Signaled, signaled really the collapse of the Conservatives in areas they had wanted to capture. Uh, it also um, signaled the collapse of the bloc in areas where there shouldn't have been any problem in trying uh, to win. Uh, by the time we got to Quebec City, <laughs> by the time we got to Quebec City, uh, the tsunami, the, the wave was, was gathering strength and the tsunami was about to break. Uh, since these were not only conservative ridings that were going down, uh, but also bloc ridings uh, that 
could have been uh, winnable for the Conservatives. The area on the south shore of Montreal, this is as blue as they come in terms of the Bloc Québécois votes. This is the Patriot area. This is where the BQ has won by margins of 10, 15, and 20,000 votes. All of it was going to the NDP. By the time the wave uh, broke in um, urban Montreal, on the island of Montreal, liberal strongholds that had been held by the Liberal Party since the beginning of time, which means Wilfrid Laurier's time, uh, were now turning to the NDP. Westmount St. Marie, Notre Dame de Grasse. These are places where, you know, if you, the, the, literally you could have had a mailbox running mm -hmm. through the Liberal Party, and they were all going down with very, I don't know, I want to put the quality in quotation marks, but very well-known candidates, very experienced yeah. candidates were falling. So that was the way it looked from the election desk uh, as we were bringing these, uh, these results in. When the dust cleared, uh, the history books were, are now full of notations because of the 2011 uh, election. It's the first conservative majority in a very long time since Brian Mulroney, the first conser new conservative majority, I would say, with this new brand of a, of a conservative party. Uh, it's the first majority without a sizable representation from Quebec. Uh, perhaps the exception of Diefenbaker in 1958, but still, I think the numbers are still uh, pretty astounding. It's the first time the NDP has won official opposition status in the House of Commons. This has been a long time coming for the NDP as the perennial third party. This is the first time that the Liberal Party finds itself as a third party in the House of Commons. This is the first sweep of Quebec by a non-resident leader since Diefenbaker. I say non-resident because Jack Layton was not in Montreal uh, giving that acceptance speech. He was in Toronto. And that, to me, was an important optical uh, since I saw those flag wavings, I thought it was a unity rally. I thought we were back in 1995 and I was at some unity rally uh, in the streets of Montreal. Didn't he grow up in Montreal though? He did, he grew Hudson. up in Hudson, yeah. just outside of Montreal. And his, fa his, his um, family company is called Leighton and Sons. It's a music store in St. Catherine Street, it's still there. You can go by, it's right just uh, west of Peel Street on uh, Montreal. And the Bloc Québécois, which has been a major force in Quebec politics since 1993, lost its official party status. So all of those things are asterisks in the history books, uh, which have yet to be written, but still, um, it's an interesting uh, set of events. What happened? Um, I think one of the things that I just want to maybe not correct Herb on, but offer a different interpretation of the facts, is that the orange crush and the jack mania didn't happen until the Liberal Party started to collapse mm -hmm. in Quebec. So by the second week of the campaign, two things had started to become very clear. One was that the Liberal vote was collapsing. And that's a word that I'm not prone to hyperbole, but that's exactly what was happening, is that the Liberal vote was collapsing in Quebec. And the bloc fatigue, which had already been apparent, was also beginning to rise exponentially. So those two things, right, on the one hand, the collapse of the Liberals, and on the other hand, the rise in bloc fatigue, left open a space, a political space, a vacuum, and that is where Jack Mania was able to fill. The leaders' debate was very important um, because it showed Jack Layton not only at the top of his game, but all of a sudden on the offensive against parties who kind of didn't know what to do about it. Gilles Duceppe kind of was like, wait a minute, Jack, you're supposed to be on my side. It was very interesting to see Jacques, uh, Gilles Duceppe fight on two fronts in that leadership debate, right? His, his goal was to, you know, encourage the anti-conservative vote, which he did, except that it got transferred uh, to uh, the NDP. The other thing that was important about the NDP in Quebec, uh, so there was this vacuum created, there was this fixation on this leader, Le Bon Vieux Jacques, Jack Clayton, as some people, c'est quoi son nom? Clayton, Layton, whatever. S'appelle Jacques. I'm voting for him. Uh, you know, he and he showed up in Canadiens hockey sweaters and watched the game in the bar. I mean, it was just these moments are magical, as they say in politics. And you can't. It's 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 stuff money can't buy. The other thing about the NDP, though, is the new in the New Democratic Party. This, for all intents and purposes, was a new party for Quebecers. Okay, so they saw Jack Layton on Tout le monde en parle. They saw him in the debates. They saw him wearing the, the, um, the Montreal jersey. Uh, all of a sudden, this was a new party. And you know how new parties can sweep Quebec politics. It's happened before. The bloc 
um, the ADQ. Uh, this is the kind of phenomenon we were seeing with the NDP. The other thing that has been pointed out is the NDP spoke the language of Quebecers. I don't mean French. I mean the center left and left progressive kind of votes, their position on things that matter to Quebec, like the environment, like foreign policy to a certain extent, we'll get into that at least in terms of Afghanistan, uh, like uh, the, the sort of pro-union, pro-state kind of uh, discourse. These are things that Quebecers have traditionally been attracted to, and so it was really the perfect storm that was able to allow the NDP to fill that political vacuum and it basically to explode uh, from there. Just briefly on the Bloc Québécois, um, I think that what happened to the Bloc Québécois is that the Bloc Québécois became uh, sort of a victim of its own contradictions. The Bloc Québécois is a motley crew. Right? <laughs> it tries to straddle both the left and the right. right? If you look at the, the, the MPs and where the Bloc gets its strength, it's both from the left and the right. It's become much more of a left-wing party under Gilles Duceppe but that's not where its origins necessarily are. But on that other fundamental and crucial cleavage in Quebec politics, which is not just left-right, but the federalist sovereigntist cleavage, which is really important in the way people decide who to send to, to Ottawa from Quebec, they were also straddling both the sovereigntists and what we call in Quebec federalist nationalists, which are people who are nationalists first, but agree that federalism might be a good idea 15 times out of 20, I don't know, some of the time, okay? Some of the time. So the bloc was left facing its own internal contradictions because of this election campaign and its uh, failure to be able to do something with that orange wave uh, has led to the fact that it has now lost official party status and will have to rebuild from there. But before we kind of sort of uh, jump on the bandwagon as Mr. Uh, Harper did and start crowing about how he saved Canadian federalism, just want to remind everybody uh, that not all of the people who voted for the NDP are born-again Federalists. Uh, that even though the NDP was able to do a phenomenal thing, which was to blur regional boundaries in Quebec, uh, those regional uh, interests are still there. And that, uh, you know, long live, long, so the bloc is dead, but long live sovereignty. And I think that's sort of a message that has to also be thought about. That even though the bloc may be dead as a political party, um, that sovereignty as a political movement uh, is not. Just a few words about the Conservative Party to say that a lot of the vote that we saw going to the NDP was an anti-conservative vote. Now, it was anti-conservative. Some of it might have been just anti-Ottawa in general, sort of a pox on all your houses, I'm voting for Jack, you know? Uh, but uh, some of it was specifically anti-conservative. But instead of going to the Bloc or to other parties, went to the NDP once they started to look like they were on, uh, on a roll. It may have also been what I call the whatever vote in Quebec, which is sort of the whatever, you know, or wait a minute, let me say whatever vote in Quebec, which is really basically like the rhinoceros party vote, which was like, who, who the hell cares what's happening in Ottawa? I'm going to vote NDP. So there's, there's a lot of that. That's not something that's a minor force in Quebec politics, and I think we have to sort of remember that uh, as well. Harper has achieved its go his goal of destroying the Liberal Party in Quebec. <laughs> I really doubt that the Liberal Party can come back uh, with a brand that was already in such, a, in such a, a bad shape. Speaking of the future of the Liberal Party, let's just take a couple of minutes to talk about what the future holds. I'm nominating you for leader. No, no, way, so no, 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 no. I'm a professor. I'm out. Apparently, I'm out. We're all out. The ivory tower has had its day in Canadian politics. Though I see Ian here, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to. So a general side, collective relief, few if you have a majority, you don't have to talk about politics until 2015, that's fine. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention that there's not a lot of new McGill students in, in Parliament, which is nice. Uh, some of them are women, you'd be happy to know. Three out of the four McGill students are, uh, are women. Uh, since I'm nonpartisan, let me give you all some free advice. The Liberal Party, uh, so what's going to happen, what the future holds? I just said the Liberal Party is, is dead in Quebec, so <laughs> not, here's, here's what I think. It has to either rebuild or transform, you know this, yes. right? I think it's going to be very difficult in Quebec. The brand has already suffered so much that now it really has, frankly, very little resonance. I think a lot of liberal voters were liberated to vote NDP, right? They have been voting liberal because that's what you do if you want to save federalism, and they were simply liberated in voting NDP. And I th think a lot of BQ voters were liberated in voting NDP by saying, you know, I'd like federalism to work. I don't want to have to vote 
BQ, I'm going to vote. Uh, I'm going to vote uh, for uh, the NDP. That's why I think the Liberal Party has a lot of uh, a lot of work to do. Um, if you just needed someone to lead you out of the wilderness, you could have had Jack Layton. I, you have to get off this white knight syndrome. Forget it. You know this is not you. This is not helpful. This is not helpful for the Liberal Party. This is free advice, so you don't have to take it. I'm just saying uh, we that have to the get Jake La uh, Jack Layton or Clayton, whatever he's called, Wha I'll join Tim. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. Clayton, Layton, just go for it. But don't go for it. The White Knight syndrome is what's killing the Liberal Party, and it's killing it because this party doesn't know where its space is on the political checkerboard. We're looking at a polarization now, left, right, in Canadian politics. Uh, Mackenzie King's big specter of fear in the 1940s was that the Liberal Party would go the way of the Liberals in Britain, mm -hmm. squeezed out between the left and the right. You don't want to have Mackenzie King's ghost on your plate or anywhere else, so you want to think about that uh, in, uh, in the future. The Bloc Québécois. The Bloc Québécois is also in an exist existential frame of mind because there are a lot of people in the sovereignty movement who never saw the point of the Bloc being in Ottawa in the first place. There has always been contention about the Bloc being in Ottawa, and the only reason the Bloc has survived is because the sovereigntists in the group and the sovereigntists in Quebec saw it winning election after election and said, okay, fine, whatever, resources, energy can be expended. I, don't th I think the day has come for the bloc to come home uh, to its roots, and I think that's going to mean two things. That's going to mean that um, there's going to be a bigger, not a push for sovereignty, but I think sovereigntists are going to become a little bit more aggressive and uh, a lot louder inside Quebec than they have been. And we're going to see with the, the provincial election next year, uh, with the Parti Québécois riding pretty high in the, in the polls, what's going to happen about that. The Conservatives have to do uh, two things. One is stand and deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you do that? Well, I can. Okay, you can, yeah, well, we know you can. <laughs> uh, ready, I ready. <laughs> stand and deliver, right. Uh, and then think Wait about whether- the power line comes Yes, down. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see it now. Gilles Deceppe saw it too, but I think he touched it, which is yeah. not what you're supposed to do in politics. The third rail has, has finally caught up with Gilles Deceppe. In fact, it was, it was, it, he wanted to make that an issue, and yes, it didn't he did, work. And he it didn't work. So just, just, mm -hmm. uh, just saying. Uh, you have to think about whether Quebec is over. Yep. You know, is Quebec over for the Conservative Party? Because uh, so far, uh, it's, not, it's not been a very good love the, the, I think the love affair is over. I think it's been over for a while, but you know. Love. Uh, Don't talk to there's me. There's other about things besides <laughs> love. There's other sides bes bes uh, besides love, and after and after the love affair, other things uh, can happen. The NDP has to do two things. One is to keep its caucus together. So I'm going to call my students and tell them to behave, uh, which is the first thing. The baker, the bricklayer, the barmaid, all of these people are going to have to come together. There is, you know, all jokes aside, there is a thread and there is uh, a certain um, coherence to that caucus from Quebec. These are all people who ha are from the left, right? So there's students, a student movement, environmentalists, community activists, a lot of labor leaders. So there is a coherent thread. It's a left-wing thread. Uh, the problem is that these people who are elected are not necessarily people who are connected to their communities. Because the NDP won in Bertie Masquinonger. Uh, that barmaid has never been to Bertie Masquinonger. <laughs> uh, she doesn't speak French. I hope she knows where it is on a map. These are people who are not connected to their community, and now they have a big responsibility, right? You go to yep. Parliament, you're supposed to be representing your constituents. This is not an idle kind yep. of a job. They have to get connected. They have to build an organization. They have to do something with the responsibility that has been given to them, even by the whatever vote uh, of Quebecers. I think that the other thing the NDP has to do is decide whether it's going to become a Quebec party or not, right? Yep. Since 60, 60 of its seats are now from the province of Quebec, that uh, is going to be very, very difficult to do. They, they are in their own kind of internal power struggle. And there I agree with you, uh, Tim, uh, on that. I don't know about the teachable moments. I know that Scotty's going to go into the Canada-US relationship. Just let me s uh, say that I don't think it's going to uh, affect that relationship. Gary Doerr, who's our ambassador, right, is from the great, uh, the great new official opposition party originally. Um, I think we're, 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 not, we're going to see what was on the agenda about the security perimeter uh, about Afghanistan. But you know what? The NDP is going to really do a lot of yelling and screaming in the House of Commons. So it, you know, the NDP now has its moment to bring all of these things in which there is a definitive difference, right? a salient difference between it and uh, the Conservatives in a way that was not true of the Liberal opposition to the fore. So there's going to be a lot of drama about the United States in this new session of Parliament. And <laughs> for a change. Can't wait. Uh, so I think that's something that we're going to learn. Uh, we're going to see the U.S. being used a lot more in Canadian politics.
politics, and I'm going to let Scotty talk about that part of it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Antonia. Hearing your very, uh, very interesting presentation, one is tempted to appreciate fully uh, the political death, the political resurrection, the liberation, the complexity, not so much as a day in the life of Quebec politics, but a telenovela uh, that you might find on, on American television. Uh, <laughs> it's really when you, when you hear from time to time that an American president would love to have the authority and powers and ability to act in a manner that a prime minister with a majority can act, uh, if that prime minister, or if that president, excuse me, were to take a closer look at what's required to become a prime minister with a majority government, I think the president would back away and say, <laughs> Washington is perhaps yeah, a better place. Yeah, you've got to be careful what you wish for. That's right, exactly. Uh, turning now uh, to our next guest, uh, Scotty Greenwood, uh, who is uh, a longstanding uh, colleague of mine in the field of Canada-U.S. Uh, issues and relations. Uh, Scotty is very well suited to be with this panel and a participant in this panel today, uh, in particular because of her long-standing involvement in politics in the United States. Uh, she has been involved in several uh, very significant campaigns, both regionally and nationally, and has held uh, increasingly res more responsible and senior positions within her party. Uh, on those occasions. She did take a break, a pause, to enjoy winter in Ottawa <laughs> for a few years, uh, where winters, she was, actually. but who's counting, right? right. Uh, where she was Chief of Staff at the United States Embassy in Ottawa. Uh, Scotty um, is now uh, with the, uh, the firm of uh, McKenna Long Aldridge, where she also is Managing Director of uh, uh, Issues and, and um, a particular Committee on International Trade within, uh, within the firm. Um, Scotty, you and I have, uh, as I mentioned, been involved in a wide variety of cross-border issues over time, maybe more than we actually uh, thought we'd be getting into when we first started. Uh, but if you were at the United States Embassy today, this week, and called upon to advise uh, your colleagues here in Washington, D.C. on the road ahead in the issues that we need to deal with or need to be dealt with, and in, on a priority basis, what would be some of your comments? And I know you have a, a brief presentation to make mm -hmm. here on screen as well. Welcome, Scott. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, to the Wilson Center. At, it's always good. I think somebody's going to – I only have one slide, but if somebody can tee it up for me, that'd be good. There she is. Um, uh, so I'll answer the question right at the end, Paul. I, I mean, the, the short answer is it's always easier to deal with a majority government, right, if you're the – if you're a bilateral partner, it's just it's just more organized, regardless of who has the majority. Um, it's really good to be here. I will say just briefly, you know, uh, uh, that our economies are so integrated. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, Herb, the Canadian, is sitting there with an iPad. I, the American, have a BlackBerry. Um, but more importantly, uh, the chairman of our board, Kelly Johnston, who's here, is with Campbell Soup Company, an iconic American brand uh, whose big facility, uh, one of the biggest facilities, is in Ontario. His predecessor, Karen Phillips, uh, is with an iconic Canadian company, CN. And, you know, they bought Illinois Central, and they're really the NAFTA railroad. So uh, our economies really are quite integrated, and so that's why this discussion is so important. Um, I'm going to make a couple of observations about the Canadian elections and, and try not to repeat uh, what has been said. Uh, I, I always look for new ways uh, to understand things. I'm not sure if this analogy works, but I'm going to tell you, um, sort of in the narrative that I watched develop over uh, the last six weeks in the campaign, I came up with an analogy. Uh, and then I'll also talk about uh, the key moments, the election really wasn't six weeks. It really has been developing um, over time as the parties defined each other, or rather as um, the Harper Conservatives did a very good job of defining their opponents. But anyway, uh, whoops, come back. She's going to come back. This always happens. This is why you shouldn't use slide. I promise. Okay. Use this one. There we go. So if the Canadian elections were a game of, pick your game, I chose Monopoly, here's what I think the narrative about each campaign would be. Uh, Har the Harper campaign was really law and order and the campaign of government. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Uh, but so it's go directly to jail. They're the law. <laughs> Do not collect $200. That's Harper. 
Um, Harper did an extraordinarily good job of defining Ignatieff, I think, as the guy who didn't spend any time in Canada. He's just visiting. And I thought that was quite effective, actually, and he wasn't able to counter that. Um, and then the free ride, if you will, the, 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 the campaign where you really didn't have to take responsibility um, for how to govern or how to pay for your huge agenda uh, was late, and of course, and that's get out of jail free. So that's, <laughs> my, uh, that's my one slide uh, for the day. So let me talk about uh, each campaign in turn, and then um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the campaign that wasn't run, um, but could have been if, let's say, um, a devastatingly effective political operative like Nelson Cunningham, who's with us, uh, had been at the helm. So we'll see if Nelson agrees with me. And Ian will have to cover his ears at that point. So Leighton, I, I thought it was interesting, if you looked at the TV advertising, and maybe it's just me, maybe I'm a little sensitive, but he referred to himself as a Democrat. He didn't refer to himself as a new Democrat. And I'm just wondering if, if that was a subtle way to align with Obama and the Democrats. I don't, I don't know. Um, I agree that the debates were a turning point for him. Uh, it, it's been said. But it wasn't just the debate. It wasn't just the devastating um, attack on Ignatia for not showing up to work, which was uh, quite effective. But it was followed up by TV advertising that made the same point and highlighted uh, Ignatieff's attendance record. And there were some, some very uh, effective, cute, humorous, uh, yet devastating ads. Um, I, I have Quebec fatigue with the sovereignties written down. It's interesting. Fatigue is the word that we use. Um, it also helped that uh, Leighton, um, if I could use the word pandered, uh, uh, he talked about his agenda, but he pander pandered to some Quebecers, including, for example, saying that if you work for the federal government uh, in Quebec, you shouldn't have to speak English, um, which I thought was an interesting platform for a, a, a presumed leader uh, to take. Um, but he, he generally has a common touch at a time when populism uh, is relevant in North American politics. And if you look at his caucus and if you look at the Tea Party here, that common touch is really important. And in, in the all-important test, um, which we have in the United States, uh, for electing people of uh, who do you want to have a beer with, Jack Layton is the guy that you would want to have a beer with in this race, I would say. Uh, turning to Harper. Mr. Harper uh, had extraordinarily, extraordinary message discipline, uh, which is important in campaigns. He focused on constituency politics. Um, he, was, he was dutiful. Uh, you know, he's not the most charismatic figure that's come in politics. Um, and yet, he won this very impressive majority. There are a couple of journalists that, you know, sort of look at his, his his glaze and call him shark eyes. You know, he's, he, you know, he's not that warm, and yet he does his job really well. I happen to um, be in Vancouver for the Olympics, and was just as a guest of NBC, was staying at the hotel where the prime minister and his party were also staying. And you know, he was doing a lot of stuff. I, I, I was just a tourist. I, you know, there was no need to interact. But, but his team sort of saw me. We were Blackberry, and they said, you know, why don't you get your picture taken? And I was like, you know, he doesn't want to do that. I don't. It's all. We're just. Let's just enjoy the curling. You know, and yet um, <laughs> they brought him over, uh, and he was really funny. Um, he was really ribbing me about, you know, um, hockey and all and curling and all of that. So um, I, I got a, just a little tiny sense of um, of his ability, uh, despite the fact that that he is not um, he doesn't come across as the warmest retail politician ever. Doesn't he look like the guy in uh, Dallas? J.R. Owen. J.R. <laughs> not a dream, man. <laughs> I think David Biet's beginning to look like Woodrow Wilson, but that's okay. <laughs> you work at a place where you have a dog long enough, you start to look like each other, right? Um, uh, I, I think n Don't now the campaign there. wasn't just <laughs> wasn't just six <laughs> weeks long, right? The, the narratives about the candidates uh, and the leaders developed a long time ago. Um, I think that Harper's best asset, no offense, Tim, is his wife. I think her instincts um, are spectacular. And one of the turning points in the way people began to see um, Stephen Harper happened a while ago at the National Arts Center uh, when there was a gala. And to the surprise of everyone in the room, except uh, Lorreen Harper, he, Harper came out and performed. And he gave a very good and funny performance uh, with a little help from my friends. And, and, and it humanized him in a way uh, that I think benefited him in the long term. Um, so I give a lot of credit to his wife. I think uh, the biggest missed opportunity in terms of developing him on the world stage, let me say, he has a majority, but it's funny, you know, my math is, is not that good, but a majority, he, he got 38, 40% of the vote, and yet that's a majority here. 
it's similarly weird in the United States Senate, a majority, you have to get at least 61 of the 100. So majority is a funny number. But anyway, he, does, he didn't have, uh, you know, 60 percent of the, of the national vote. He has a majority government, but he had a plurality of the vote. Exactly right. Well said, Professor. Um, so I think what could have made it bigger, one of his uh, biggest missed opportunities happened um, on February 19th, just down the street here um, in Washington. February, was it 17th or 19th? But anyway. Um, the Prime Minister of Canada came to Washington and had uh, a, a meeting with the President of the United States. Um, that was the week, you might recall, that the, the, the Egypt, the, the Middle Eastern world was, was uh, changing in ways that we didn't understand. And Egypt uh, was happening, okay? The chaos in Egypt was unfolding. People didn't know what was going to happen. The President of the United States had not yet spoken publicly. Um, about Egypt. So they were having a press conference on a Friday. Uh, it was going to be the joint presser that normally when the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada hold a joint press conference, you know, five journalists show up, four of them are Canadian, and one of them is the pool person that has to cover the President regardless. And it's a pretty, you know, standard thing. In this case, because the President of the United States hadn't yet spoken about the crisis in Egypt, the press room was going to be full. Everybody knew all week building into this that this was going to be a press conference honestly about Egypt, okay? And so you had the World Press Corps, the U.S. Big Feet. You also had U.S. media cutting into their coverage, which doesn't happen a lot for a Canadian Prime Minister bilat with the President of the United States. The Canadians always cover it, you know, gavel to gavel all day. The Americans generally don't. Um, but in this case, you had everybody cutting into their coverage, et cetera. And so the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada, the flags are set up, Canada, U.S., Canada, U.S., the President of the United States comes out and he goes, um, I've just had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Canada. I'm going to talk about that meeting, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Egypt. Okay? So he does that. He then turns it to Harper. So, so at which point I thought what the Prime Minister would do was talk about, for a minute, while everybody's paying attention, the conversation these two leaders just had about Egypt, um, our common values uh, uh, in support of democracy around the world, he would have looked uh, quite like a, an important world leader, and coverage would have stayed on him uh, from from the U.S. press. Instead, what he did, which is something he always does uh, when he has these opportunities outside of the U.S., is he talked about he talked in French. It seemed like for hours about this conversation they just had about how to run the border and how to do the trade, right? And so what, and that's fine, but but. Um, the, the, the world press and the U.S. press turned away, cut away from the Prime Minister of Canada and started talk, had their Egypt people on, right? So my only point here is, um, I know you got to play to your politics at home, but had he sort of said, I'm just going to spend, you know, 30 seconds here talking about Egypt because the President and I just had a very good conversation about it, then you would have had maybe, maybe not, but commentators sort of saying, well, you know, Canada, really important ally with us on Egypt, et cetera. Anyway, um, not really a criticism, just kind of a missed opportunity um, in the narrative. Is he the guy you want to have a beer with? No, which is another reason he didn't get, um, he only got a plurality, because I think he drinks beer light. I mean, that, he comes across as the guy who drinks the non-alcoholic O'Doul's. And you feel a little awkward if you're ch chugging the beers. Anyway, so, so I want to have a beer with Leighton, not Harper. Ignatiev, briefly, Mr. Ignatiev. Um, his campaign had a financial disadvantage for years for structural reasons that we can talk about. So the playing field was a little bit uneven. Um, uh, the conservatives very effectively defined Harper, I mean, defined Iggy, um, and were unanswered. Uh, their definition of him was unanswered all this time. Uh, I've already talked about just visiting, but the ads that the conservatives did, I thought, were spectacularly effective at showing that Ignatieff is practically American, only came back because he's an opportunist, kind of an elitist, and didn't come back to Canada for you, certainly, and maybe won't stay. Um, and I'm not saying that that's true. I'm saying that that was an effective, unanswered uh, uh, sort of narrative about him uh, that would have, uh, that I think impacted uh, the election. Um, you definitely would not have a beer with this guy because you're pretty sure he doesn't drink beer. He drinks uh, red wine, Claret. And in fact, he was with students. Um, you know, how's this for retail politics? He was with students where he talked about um, the fact that he doesn't smoke pot, he prefers red wine. I'm not sure that's the way I would reach out. Um, as long as he um, doesn't inhale the red wine, <laughs> we'd have a health problem. Uh. Yeah, in a country that thinks its two best inventions are beer and hockey, uh, you know. <laughs> um, okay, now, now for the campaign that was not run, and I'm not advocating it, by the way, and I should have said this at the beginning, I'm 
nonpartisan, and nothing that I'm saying now um, are, are official positions of the Canadian American Business Council. This is just me spouting. Um, but he, so I, I need that caveat right away. So if Nelson Cunningham were running a campaign against Harper, what would you have done? Um, Harper's ads, first of all, were effective at killing Ignatieff because they played to what people already felt about Iggy, i.e. that he was an elitist, he spent time out of the U.S., he didn't care about the concerns of ordinary Canadians, and it, the, the messaging played right into that. Ads that might have been effective about Harper would have played into people's suspicions about him. Um, he's suspicions. I'm not advocating this. He's mean-spirited, he's small-minded, he's a bit of an extremist. Um, you could cite the fact that he wanted to eliminate funding for the opposition parties, that he plays to the right wing of the country, um, that he doesn't take on the lofty challenges. Ian Brody's going to kill me in a minute. And that, that his party was found in contempt of parliament. They were found in contempt of parliament, all those things. You could also play to the views that Canadians really have of themselves and their country um, and its role of the world. And um, you could start with a narrative, again, back, going back before the six weeks, um, Steve Holloway just left in protest. <laughs> um, you could start. Uh, you, you could you could say that that Harper isn't isn't really good enough for Canada, and that he's embarrassed Canada on the on the world stage. Um, you could talk about uh, the, when when Canada hosted the G8 and the G20, um, the position that Harper took on the issue of maternal health and the whole problem that evolved. If you remember the stories at the time about whether or not um, he's really a pro-life extremist. Um, in sheep's clothing, if you will, um, and the whole kerfuffle that occurred with uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton on that visit, that would be potentially strike one. You could also talk about Copenhagen and whether Harper has embarrassed Canada on the world stage with what some people perceive as knuckle dragging on the climate change file. Again, I don't actually believe that, but I'm saying that's a narrative you could have developed. That would be strike two. Strike three could have been the failure to get the seat on the UN Security Council. You know, sort of, he's not good enough for, for Canada. Canada is better than that. And you d yet you didn't see any of that narrative develop. Each of those stories I described was sort of a one-day blip. It was a bit of a gaffe, but it wasn't a defining narrative. Um, about how this guy is too small-minded and too extreme and not good enough for Canada. Um, that, that, in my judgment, is the only way uh, that if you were going to take him on, uh, you could have done it effectively. And again, you would have had to be, have been doing this for the last three or four years in a way that none of the opposition parties um, either had the appetite for, perhaps, um, or, or just the ability, maybe Canadians are just too nice, um, maybe they don't believe uh, any of the narrative that I just outlined, but anyway, that, uh, that's the only way I see you could have taken down Harper, um, and it didn't happen. So, Canada now has a majority conservative government. What does that mean for Canada-U.S. relations? Um, as I said at the top, I think it's a very good thing. Uh, it's just easier to deal with majorities. It's nice to know that you're not going to have an election for a few years. Um, the U.S., I, I uh, predict, will strongly now urge the government of Canada um, to finally deal with the intellectual property protection request. It's the single largest trade irritant between, that the U.S. has. It's the U.S. number one wish on the wish list that Canada pass legislation and um, come into uh, you know, modern times with this protection of intellectual property. I think that's going to be the U.S.'s number one request. As for Canada, I think that the Harper government now has an opportunity to really push, if it, would, if it wants to, to really push forward on these two bilateral initiatives that they announced in February that were put on hold during the Canadian election, but those are on the border vision and on regulatory harmonization. That would have to come from Canada. The U.S. won't do it because we've moved on to other things, but if they want to ask for that, that would be um, terrific and I think very important and useful for business. And then the final thing is I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with economics and trade policy. Um, the, the deal with India was mentioned, the deal with the EU would be interesting, but also what happens to the Toronto Stock Exchange, London um, Stock Exchange merger? You know, is it, are, are, can, can you do that now um, or not? So to, to conclude, and I only have actually one conclusion, Tim. Um, uh, the, so if you want to set aside monopoly, if you didn't like that, um, let's take country music as the defining uh, uh, narrative. So, so for Harper, there's a line in country music um, Beer is, I, I think it's, somebody can correct me, but beer is good, God is great, and people are crazy. Um, for Leighton, uh, it's everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now, is the line in the song. Um, for Ignatieff, uh, the line in the song is, um, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up somewhere else. <laughs> um, and then for Duceppe, it's not a country song, but my favorite uh, philosopher, Lily Tomlin, said, uh, we're all in this alone. <laughs> so, anyway.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Scotty. I'm glad you used Monopoly. Uh, you could have used Trivial Pursuit, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you've set out some very, uh, very thought-provoking uh, ideas in your presentation. I, too, uh, would agree that uh, copyright intellectual property uh, will be very much uh, the first push on the part of the United States government with respect to what it now wants and would hope the government of Canada would move on. Uh, for those of you who follow these things closely, uh, the United States Trade Representative's Office issued a report earlier this week uh, in fact, on Monday afternoon, in which Canada was still on what is called the priority watch list on issues of copyright uh, counterfeit, uh, this particular sector. I know that the United States government has been frustrated uh, for some time that the lack of a majority government seems to have been the cover behind which uh, Canada has, um, has stood uh, without moving uh, more effectively and uh, expeditiously in this area. Uh, having a, minor, a majority government certainly does create expectations on the part of one's uh, bilateral uh, partners. Uh, at least the President knows that uh, this Prime Minister, as a very strong ally, uh, strong friend in Canada, will be here beyond 2012 and may continue to be his bilateral counterpart in uh, Canada-U.S. relations for some time. Uh, the new majority also, in my view, should enable the Government of Canada to be able to propose certain things to the United States and in so doing with the majority government uh, Washington will appreciate that Ottawa can in fact uh, deliver or hold its ground or act in a particular way which uh, it may not have been able to do uh, over the last uh, few years because of minority. Uh, we would hope that decision making in Ottawa policy pronouncements will be more decisive that uh, we would like uh, on the foreign affairs front in terms of uh, the kind of uh, analysis and work that I do in, in Washington. I would hope that we would see greater transparency. I take uh, Scotty's point with respect to the uh, joint press conference in Washington. Uh, it was quite remarkable how quickly uh, the networks did shift in our own offices. I had um, insisted that my colleagues sit down uh, with at least two different channels on so that we could watch and compare the, the coverage. And it was uh, virtually immediate. Uh, I recall one newscaster saying, that's French. We don't do French. Uh, and we're now <laughs> moving to our uh, Egypt expert. And, and the whole thing was just shot. Uh, the Canadian media in Washington had not been well briefed. We all know that uh, media travel with a visiting head of government, which was the case, but the, the, even they had not uh, been well briefed on exactly what it was the Government of Canada was uh, proposing to collaborate on uh, with the Government of the United States. I would hope that in the time frame that we have available to us, and it's complicated by the political cycle that we're in now in Washington, that the work that has tentatively begun uh, with respect to the cross-border undertakings by the two governments, that that will move ahead more quickly. Uh, as the American submissions uh, to uh, Washington offices have been put up on a public web website, I hope too that Canadian stakeholder submissions could also be placed on a public website so that indeed a broader public and a broader section of cross-section of stakeholders in both countries could have a, a better sense of what various interests uh, might propose with respect to uh, greater work on standards, on regulatory frameworks and whatnot. Uh, the whole issue of perimeter security, I believe it was mentioned uh, post-election night that uh, the government will uh, more readily look at uh, a more robust uh, perimeter security idea uh, and plan. Uh, the opposition as such is not large enough to do, uh, to be very effective in opposing. It can ask questions and it can oppose in the manner that it can engage in a lot of rhetoric. I would hope that the opposition may, in doing so, also come forward in Ottawa with some creative ideas on how to make the best of uh, what Canada might pursue in its relations with the United States. I would also hope that in the area of energy that the federal government might be, might be able to take uh, a more robust and uh, leadership role on one of the biggest national interests that can economic interest Canada has and that's in the energy sector uh, oil sands being but one area but across the board on energy that is still 
uh, a set of files that are incredibly important to Canada economically and also will help uh, uh, guarantee a, a, a vastly better economic future for not only the country as a whole but regions as Tim referred to earlier. On Afghanistan, uh, maybe in the shorter or to the midterm with respect to Libya, uh, a majority government should be able to, uh, if, it's, if it wishes to maintain its policy on holding the line with respect to Afghanistan, but I think here the Quebec card, as it were, is going to be particularly important and sensitive and related very much to how the uh, government of the day sees its future in Quebec uh, four years hence. And then, of course, issues uh, such as fighter airplanes actually can loom uh, more importantly now uh, as a purchase from the United States for anybody who has watched the recent decision of the Indian government on its purchase of uh, fighter planes. Its purchase is not uh, going to the United States. You may recall, uh, again, the President's uh, uh, significant visit to India uh, the, pro uh, the effort to, to promote and to sell uh, American defense technology was very much front and center in that trip. Uh, it, this is uh, a failure that has, uh, uh, for many people, uh, been below the radar because of other stellar events of the last uh, uh, f 10 days in this, in this city. And lastly, I have a, a personal interest issue in play here. Uh, I come from uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, I believe that the next foreign minister should come from Niagara Falls. Uh, I think that uh, it's time, long overdue, uh, whether it's Niagara or it's some particular part of the border, uh, but it's long overdue in that uh, Canada, if we look at the, uh, by far, the, uh, the huge part of the overall relationship which is related to security, both economic and personal, uh, national, that uh, we need a foreign minister who has a sense of what that border has been, what it is, and what it could be. And uh, any stellar member of the government who, uh, who has been elected from one of those border ridings, uh, I'm thinking of uh, the present justice minister, but uh, uh, anybody. I think it's, um, it's uh, as I say, a personal point I would make that uh, we need a, a minister, not a borderline minister, we need a minister who understands the border. Paul, who do you Thank want you. to be the critic, the foreign affairs critic? Yeah. The, the bartender, maybe? Well, I, I'm keen on tattoos, so. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as a McGill graduate, I think, why not a McGill? Uh, why not? The 19-year-old. That's right, the 19-year-old. Fresh ideas. So there we have it. Thank you very much. Let's uh, please open quickly to discussion. And uh, in posing your questions, if you could identify yourself. And uh, we have uh, individuals here who will bring uh, a microphone to you. And I think there's Ian, Brody Ian Brody to, in the room. He I've heard that himself. name. And could we pass uh, a microphone over I know to Ian? What the or let's have uh, Ian speak. Wasn't Paul Martin Sr. from Windsor? Yeah. Yes. Yes, he was. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Know, thank you for the opportunity to ask the first question. I wasn't really planning to take the first, uh, <laughs> question. You can first do it. question. Um, the panel here, I must admit, uh, played to some of my greatest fears about uh, uh, this uh, uh, particular uh, panel. Uh, I don't want to talk about the domestic side of the election because uh, I found in my six years in uh, political life and my two and a half years in the Prime Minister's office, I only ever found two Americans who were interested in discussing the writing by writing results of Canadian election campaigns. One was Karl Rove, <laughs> the other was Michael Perrone. Um, <coughs> Although I will say that I think the best uh, uh, news that I got here today was Herb Metcalf's view that there should be a two-year leadership campaign uh, in the Liberal Party. There just isn't enough cash in the, in the, in the bank account, Herb, for a two-year leadership race. You can't do it. The party will go bankrupt. And trust me, I know a few things about taking a party from 19% in the polls back to majority government status. I've, I've done it. You don't have enough cash to do that. You need a leadership campaign that wraps up sometime before the 1st of July. Um, <coughs> I'd like to talk maybe about the broader uh, international uh, context here. First of all, by my second fear that was confirmed by today's panel. If the first issue on the bilateral agenda, now that there's a majority government, is intellectual property, the yeah. U.S. government needs its head red. Uh, <laughs> the only effective bilateral spokesman on the intellectual property issue that the United States has ever sent to Canada was the former governor of California. He's unemployed. Send him if you want, but otherwise forget it. Yeah, Just yeah. forget it. We've got bigger things to deal with here. <laughs> Uh, this election in Canada was about uh, 
the past two years, two and a half years of economic management, mm -hmm. and whether you wanted to have to continue the sober economic management into the future, whether growth was secure enough that we could afford to turn our mind to the redistributive issues that the Liberal Party was worried about, or the peculiar set of issues that the NDP was worried about. And in the end, Canadians had a full airing of that issue during the campaign. The public opinion polls are quite clear. Canadians were prepared to countenance all of those options. And in the closing week of the campaign, snapped back to the economic management plan of the past two and a half years and want to continue on with that. Canadian economic growth will only be secure if U.S. economic growth is secure. So we have to find mutually beneficial opportunities to grow North American economic competitiveness. Intellectual property is not part of that agenda for the time being. We can push that to the future, please. <laughs> the big threat to intellectual property. it was in the throne speech the last two times. The, the conservatives have proposed know, it. Why no, are you no, walking look, it back, dude? It's your thing. As I say, the best bilateral spokesman on this is the former governor of California. Hire him to do it. But otherwise, he we, got, be back. We, got, we, got, we got other things to worry about. Him. I think the big question is, do the Americans want does the U.S. administration want, because I'm pretty sure Congress does, but does the U.S. administration want a deal on the Common Perimeter and Regulatory Council and regulatory reform issues? Because when I was in government, dealing with the previous administration, we all felt so rich, we didn't have to worry about all the nickeling costs that we were piling on Campbell Soup and a thousand other companies across the border. Now those costs matter. We have to confront those. They're essential to the future of the two countries together, and we're in this thing together. The question is, do we want to get a deal? I think probably the fool most foolish decision made in Canada the last 100 years was to turn down the previous uh, uh, de uh, uh, offer on a perimeter deal uh, with, the, uh, with the Bush administration. The politics have changed, as I said many times when I was in government. Now is the time to get on with it. Uh, on the bigger issue, I take uh, Scotty's comment about the um, February uh, press conference uh, right. I think the Canadian government <coughs> has to decide, has the freedom to decide um, what role it wants to play internationally, uh, how it wants to align itself uh, with the U.S. influence, how it wants to align itself with other influences. That's an essential part of the conversation. Again, if we have a half-hour discussion about intellectual property, it's the first discussion here. We're never going to get to that. <coughs> I think, though, there's a greater, longer-term risk here in the relationship that we have to pay some attention to. For the past 100 years, when it was clear that Canadian power at the federal level was going to alternate between a more or less conservative government and a more or less liberal government, the downside risk to American interests in the Canada-U.S. relationship yeah. was limited. But I really think the bloc is, there's no way the bloc's coming back from this. Uh, they did not lose marginally, they lost decisively. And if Herb's right, there's going to be a two-year party. The Liberal Party will be bankrupt before Christmas. Polarization now is uh, conservative NDP polarization. And depending on how the NDP places itself on the Canada-US issues, there's a possibility at some point in the future of an NDP government, which will be tempted mm -hmm. to take more NDP positions on the relationship going forward. I mean, this is a very dangerous, actually, I think, development uh, for the relationship and one that should be worrisome. But for the time being, at least, the NDP is on side for the Canadian role in the mission in Libya. The NDP has come to some accommodation about the uh, Canadian role in Afghanistan. Not a happy one, but for the time being at least, we've got uh, four years to deal with that. And I think looking further down the road here, I think we're going to have to be a little more uh, uh, careful about uh, the possibility of the alternation of government between conservative and NDP governments and what that means for the relationship. Paul, can I do a quick response? Yeah, go ahead, and then I have a comment on intellectual property. As okay, well. excellent. Um, thank you very much, Ian. I completely agree that the that the border perimeter and the regulatory harmonization are extraordinarily important to our economy, uh, to our economic recovery. My only point is that for that to come back uh, to the top of the list, uh, Canada is going to have to ask. And um, uh, I have every thought that the Prime Minister will show leadership on it. He, he showed leadership to their great credit on this uh, when they were in minority. So I don't think any reason they would, you know, s sort of step backwards. I'm just saying the U.S. won't automatically do it unless Canada asks. I also give uh, Stockwell Day credit for being willing to talk about perimeter policy openly at a time when it wasn't politically all that um, popular to do so. In terms of the NDP, the only thing I will say about that is as an American, um, we don't have the right to have an opinion 
about that. I mean, as a you know, as sort of Canada U.S. watchers, we can have our own views about which party is better for Canada U.S. and whatever. But you know, American diplomats aren't going to be able. The U.S. government isn't going to be able to sort of say, you know, geez, we're really glad uh, that the NDP isn't governing the place because they're they're going to be you know, they're going to drive the economy into the ground and be nasty to us if they ever get elected. You can say that, uh, but I don't think we can. Uh, Ian, just one, one follow-up on intellectual property. Uh, you're probably aware there are two bills working their way through the Congress, one on the Senate side, one on the House, and uh, the divisions are not partisan. The divisions are really over how solidly to go after uh, domain sites and whatnot, but it's... it's uh, very much caught up in the frustration over the sale of counterfeit goods, much of it over internet rogue sites, and uh, this is where Canada has to be uh, quite quite careful, uh, because uh, I have every reason to believe, as do others, that because we don't have a strong bipartisan division, that these bills will indeed pass, and because they're seen as very much business oriented, that. The president will not have a problem signing off on them, and I would expect that we'd see those bills pass by the, uh, probably the late fall, early early into next year, which is fairly rapid in this town. So it's just a marker for Canada that it's been on you know the top of the list of uh, I, of Ambassador Jacobson's uh, uh, agenda since he arrived in Ottawa, and it will continue to be there. And having majority. <laughs> no, I'm just saying simply that for those in the room who may not be aware, we have those two bills moving through, and it's something we, we do have to maneuver on. Well, he may be back. Well, and Ian, the President of the United States directly asked the Prime Minister for this in their meeting yeah. a couple months ago, so it doesn't get much better than that in terms of the ask. Yeah, okay, we got it. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is David Quad, and I'm a lawyer here in town. And until Monday, I thought I was an endangered species as being a liberal from Alberta. It's nice to know I have some company finally in Quebec and other parts of the country. But uh, my question is actually for Tim. You know, you talked about how Harper has successfully united the right. And I wonder one story that really hasn't played out is whether that's going to hold up. Because much as the NDP had its gravity shift to Quebec on Monday, the Conservative star Party is still very much, to borrow an old term, an alliance between some of those social conservative populists out in Alberta, and lest anyone forget, last time I checked, Alberta is actually becoming more conservative. Uh, you got Fred Morton, who was a professor of mine at university, looking to become premier. Uh, the polarization out there is it's getting, from my perspective, worse. But the point being is, now that the conservatives' gravity has shifted a little more towards Ontario, is the conservative party in any danger of some of the social boogeymen that kind of popped up during the election, and, and the media, the, 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 the Harper team did a great job of putting it out quickly. But I wonder if now that there's this majority, whether the Conservative Party itself faces some challenge in keeping its members in line, especially now that they have the horses to do what they want. I'm just disappointed he didn't talk about copyright. <laughs> I've been riveted by it as Ian has been over the course of the last 36 days. Um, and I got the democracy. Uh, yeah, well, but I, I, I got to take a shot at my friend Scotty. Scotty, your ad play was David Hurley's ad play over the last two campaigns and the one that Mr. Dion ran in the last election. That stuff has been tried and failed with the greatest of respect and uh, part of the reason it fails because it doesn't necessarily connect to where Canadians are now. Just picking up on what Ian said, I think a lot of Harper's success nationally and as a politician, while he has not had, as you rightly define, the charismatic skills, he's had the connection when it's come to the policy options that have come forward, which have been to the pocketbooks of Canadians. Yes, Canadians do appreciate their international reputation. Yes, they care about the environment, but they don't care about them as much as they do, and I mean this in the most generous Newfoundland way possible, their own immediate well-being. Uh, so that, well, that but, let me just say that's right, and but that's why you you couldn't take him on on the economic issues because the can the Canadian economy has done 
uh, magnificently well. Uh, so you'd have to take him on on something else. But that um, was all tried. The, the point, it, it failed okay. because it was, there was an overextension of that. I think there was a repetitive, so I'll get to your answer in a second, David, but I couldn't let that pass. Uh, that, that had been done so often that it became predictable. I mean, the hysterical mob screaming that Armageddon was upon us because Stephen Harper was to be prime minister started in 2004, worked once, tried every time after that what happened the conservative numbers went up because canadians went tone deaf to it to your question uh not quebecers uh, well no well and yeah uh, tim i never saw those at, so I, okay you know. you don't just to point it out just yeah. just so you know it was tried it just uh it worked once it but, was just ineffective uh well it was repetitive three times and people started okay. to, to buy the argument now you can go back to copyright. now back may, uh, copyright well yeah c32 it did die in the house uh with good reason um I think a lot of uh, f the Conservative Party is always a fragile political entity. History tells us that. Um, often the most successful conservative leaders are successful in winning because they build the party and the structure to reflect their view of how it should be administered how and, and how you win. Uh, so it, it's not entirely personality-based, but personality plays a significant role in that. However, I go back to what I said in the beginning, and I, uh, I think Ian would, would agree with this assertion. Stephen Harper knowing where, where he came from is important to understand where he's going. Uh, and his political success has been in providing stable, strong, unified direction and administration. Yes, he has helped uh, in different ways by providing different policy initiatives for key core groups within the Conservative Party. But I don't, th there, there is nothing I see that suggests to me Stephen Harper is going to be uh, any more radical than any previous Conservative leader. Uh, and I don't think there is any real legitimate pressure for him to be so. Where he will get pressure is on the economic management front different from the social conservative front, uh, simply because that is where he has affixed his brand and success barometer to. Uh, the, uh, the, the sense that anything is going to change dramatically in Canadian social policy is not one I see unfolding at all. Thank you very much. Yes. No, right, right here. Oh, I didn't, sorry, I didn't see that hand up. Uh, thank you, David Short. Um, I'd like to ask the panel if they could comment a little bit more on um, what the election will mean for Quebec and for the, uh, for the future of Canada, that with a strong majority that has very few members from Quebec, uh, the, the, the province that's 25% of the country and unique in many ways will, will inevitably be underrepresented in the cabinet. Uh, the fact the, the Conservative Party and the NDP, it seems to me, for, for some time have really had a strategy in Quebec of trying to court the soft nationalist vote because they understand the, the, the Federalist vote, they might as well write off to the Liberals. Um, can we look for Quebec to be, uh, for, for a vote recognizing uh, Quebec as a nation? Um, what, what does this mean for the prospects for another referendum in Quebec? Ooh, let me start, I guess. I, I think it would have been the seat total aside, I, I think it would have been a more dangerous proposition if Mr. Layton had have actually achieved power, and I agree with Ian that looking forward we have to be conscious of that because he now is in a place where he actually has such a significant base in Quebec and has made some significant statements, particularly about reopening the Constitution, that were he to be in a more in a greater place of affluence, that would be concerning. Certainly the Prime Minister said it yesterday, I think he's right, uh, outreach to Quebec has to be done, but if, if my province is any barometer for judging how the relationship with Quebec may work, because we did not have any Conservative members over the last two and a half years to my great chagrin, um, the uh, Newfoundland, despite the highly politicized personal battle between Danny uh, and the Prime Minister, did manage to uh, thrive, prosper, and have a fairly functionally positive relationship uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Government of Canada. I think uh, the Prime Minister himself also is keen and a good student of history and 
back to wanting to leave the party and the country in a better place, knowing that getting into interminable constitutional wrangling uh, will be the noose around his neck, uh, and he will be cautious and sensible in his administration to avoid that. I think Tim's right. The other thing I think is is that it, uh, the budget that was introduced uh, before the House fell uh, will be implemented. I think that's going to create some jobs. I think the, the the government will move forward on the HST settlement with Quebec, which is uh, which is a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. I think if you go ahead and purchase the make the jet purchase, Montreal will uh, do well. Montreal will do well. And I think you know that the the relationship will 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 build on things like that. I mean, Quebecers are concerned about jobs. They're concerned about their well-being, and uh, I and I, I don't think that uh, and the prime minister is definitely not going to revisit the constitution or open it up. So as long as that stays shut, I think uh, things will work out. <clears throat> Just two things on that. Um, one is that the last time we've seen such a sweep of Quebec by one party was in 1980, uh, Trudeau, after the first referendum, and in 1984, Mulroney, after the patriation of the Constitution. So Trudeau won that sweep by saying things would change in Quebec. You know, we were going to renew federalism, and then patriation happened. And so Mulroney won by saying, we're going to win in Quebec because we're going to change things. We're going to change federalism. So I think that uh, Monsieur Duceppe, uh, at his uh, resignation slash uh, concession speech on Monday, made a very important point when he said, the NDP is now the last chance for federalism in Canada. And I think that's an important point because when we've seen these sweeps, it's about parties who have been able to shore up the imagination of, of and I say imagination in the real sense of the word, sitting next to Tim Powers, uh, imagination that actually something will get done uh, to change this relationship. Quebecers don't get up in the morning and think about the Constitution. It's just, that's not where they're at. However, that is the issue that will define whether Quebec will become sovereign or not is whether or not there's something that goes on to recognize, uh, not just symbolically, this uh, asymmetry. The other thing uh, is, is just simply Leighton himself said, you know, I want to have the winning condition, conditions to have Quebec back in, uh, back in Canada, if you will. He's made the first step. He has 60, uh, he has 60 uh, people from his caucus. And it's very funny because now it looks like, um, you know, uh, the, the, the party that represents Canadian nationalists, right, the NDP, has, I hope everyone in the U.S. Embassy, embassy starts reading up on the history of the NDP. Don't worry. But the NDP, uh, which is the party of Canadian nationalism, which means anti-Americanism, for lack of a better term, is now sitting in a place where it is representing Quebec nationalism. And so that's an interesting turn of events. Uh, Though, in just can I just pick on that? Sorry, Scotty. You can pick everywhere you like. A yeah. uh, couple of points on that. So the expectation based on Antonio's point, is with the NDP. The expedition managed Quebec are there now, less with the Conservatives. The interesting conundrum that Leighton has was uh, in his grand crusade to have the nation drink orange crush and get the aspartame high, he also told Atlantic Canada that he thought the lower Churchill deal was a perfect thing, and he went a step farther than the Liberals and the uh, Conservatives. Not only is he going to provide a loan guarantee, he's going to build the underwater cable. Uh, this is going to be a very difficult thing for him to manage, as you would agree, in Quebec. In, in, a, in, a, in a strange sort of way, the, the spotlight may be on him and how he manages all of this in Quebec that allows the pressure to come off the Prime Minister a little bit on this front in the short term. Good answer is Nelson. Paul, before, can we, before we end, can we get to Kelly after Nelson? Because it's not career enhancing for me. Where is to. Kelly? He's back there. Oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. I didn't see your hand. Excuse me. Oh. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nelson Cunningham, and despite the extravagantly fraudulent uh, adjectives that Scotty <laughs> used uh, to describe me, I would never presume to offer any Canadian's political advice. But I do have a question, and this is really for Herb Metcalf. Um, uh, the last elections, uh, the Liberal Party has been led by thoroughgoing insiders, uh, party insiders, including one who was apparently also a Canadian outsider, which was a problem. Um, <laughs> Canadians have a, have a tradition of not turning to their premiers for national positions, which as Americans is very strange because Barack Obama notwithstanding 
Uh, we take almost all of our presidents from, from our governors who can show executive leadership, they can show they've managed a government, they can show they've managed an economy. And it strikes me that, that in this election where you had uh, a leader, Stephen Harper, who could show that he had managed an economy, he had dealt with pocketbook issues, to put up somebody against him who had never actually won, uh, held executive office, uh, nor really run a broad-based election is problematic. Uh, you've had some great premiers in the Liberal Party. As you look ahead to who your leaders should be, is it time to change that tradition of not looking to your premiers and thinking about people <laughs> who can actually bring executive experience to, to this uh, to party leadership? Bob Rainey? Ask Bob Rainey about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> job assigned, that well. Yeah. So I think the, 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 the problem with that is in, in, in Canada, history shows that those premiers that have sort of uh, become uh, leaders of, of national parties have not done well when it came to election day. And so there is there's that fear of, of, of uh, choosing someone that loses. The, the problem with the Liberal Party um, is a lengthy one. And it goes back to, uh, it finds its roots in the, in the battles between Gretchen and, and Martin. And I think that uh, when those battles were over and Mr. Martin sort of took over, what happened was is that no effort was made to encourage John Manley to stay Martin Cochon to stay, Alan Rock to stay, <laughs> Sheila Copps, which has her own sort of you know, <laughs> community. Uh, uh, wow, that's a good word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and there was sort of like this, you know, brushed aside. But and that sort of, you know, took away the sort of the, the next sort of pool of, of leadership talent. And then you know when we lost in 2006, and you looked around the table, there wasn't anybody there that was, you know, really from within and had the leadership sort of abilities. There was a group that had gone off and found Mr. Ignatia um, and uh, brought him back from Harvard and he'd, he'd won uh, his seat in the 2006 election, but that was basically uh, his, his sort of credentials for that. You had uh, Ken Dryden um, who, um, you know, could speak the heart and soul of what made Canada, but you know, uh, he couldn't get it out in 20 minutes, I mean, <laughs> an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and he was a guy, he, no, I, I'm being very honest and open here. I mean, I mean, it's I love true, Ken Dryden. Right, right, he's got right. some very good yeah, policy ideas. Right. He's just, he, he just can't st stop the speech. Um, we had Bob Ray, who um, probably if he'd run in 2002 when uh, Mr. Cretchen had uh, approached him, uh, might have been cleansed enough to run, but the Ontario caucus, you know, all they could think about was Ray Days, and he was a premier uh, on that. He's probably, in, in, from his time in the House, probably the most articulate, most political uh, member we had, uh, and understood the issues and how you, how you attack uh, Harper. Uh, then we had um, uh, Carolyn uh, Bennett, we had Teddy Fry, we had uh, Gerard Kennedy, who'd run a food bank, been a minister in the Ontario government. We had Martha Hall Finley, who uh, I forget how many votes she got. And then we had Stefan Dion, who was Scott, Bryson. uh, Scott Bryson. That's right. You had one. We had a Tory ex Tory run for us, and we had uh, no, he didn't run. But anyways, and so we got we ended up electing uh, Stefan Dion, who had been a minister, uh, but prior to prior to um, Mr. Gretchen getting him, had no real experience. Again, an intellectual, and I can say these things because I work very closely with them, uh, uh, very difficult to advise and very difficult to work for. Honest as the day is long. I mean, I think, uh, but... Um, um, but can't lose an argument. Can't lose an argument. And, and I think that goes back to the... Perf with all due no, respect. No, all I mean, likes to uh, Okay. <laughs> and and he, he, he was a terrible communicator. And, uh, and so, you know, there was... And when we got... You know, when he left, uh, there was a rush to get Iggy because there was a group in Toronto that just had to have Ignatiev. I also, and I'll probably be shot for saying this, but what the hell. Um, the, um, okay, Sarah Palin's not here. <laughs> that's good. Um, I think there is, with, within, within the Liberal Party, I actually think that there is a small group who always resent having a Quebecer lead the party. There was always the rump that wanted to get rid of get rid of Turner. There was always the rump that wanted to get rid of Kretchen. And it and it and it's it's an Anglophone 
romp, and, that, and it's probably a bad thing to say, but it exists. And that's, I mean, I mean, I think the problem, you know, with all due respect, and I have a lot of respect for Ian, is is that is that if we go in, to go into a, a leadership convention in July, there's nobody that can contribute because they've already maxed out. Two is is the race would basically be between Justin Trudeau, Dominic LeBlanc, and uh, and uh, Bob Ray. And and the the problem we have there is under the new rules, uh, we now move to not a convention, but we move to one one member one vote system. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure in place for that. Secondly, in that scenario, Justin Trudeau would I think be the leading candidate, mm -hmm. and right. and that that he's not ready for that by a long shot. So so I think. You know, we need some time to rebuild the infrastructure before, and maybe some people will come. I mean, not too many people, uh, you know, from the business community or maybe had run been ministers before, want to jump into the scene right now, where you've got 34 seats, mm -hmm. probably a, a, a deficit from the campaign, and a caucus that's, you know, there are some very good people, but there are some, some people that aren't. So, it's a long road ahead for us. Thank you very much, Herb. Kelly. Uh, Kelly Johnston, uh, Campbell Soup Company, and chair of the CBC. I want to underscore first a comment that uh, Scotty made then ask a, a very blatant political question about what this means at the provincial level for Ontario and for Quebec going forward. Uh, Scott is exactly right that if we're going to do the border issues in a very effective way, Canada does have to lead, but the best asset that the Prime Minister and his party have is the number of U.S. companies who are chopping at the bit to fix that problem. And he can leverage that very effectively if he wants to. And I think that by doing so, they might be able to get the attention of the administration, who, of course, is distracted, but they need to make this a priority, too. They haven't yet. This is a way to do that. A uh, question is that when I saw the election results waking up early on Tuesday morning, I thought of two people uh, as somebody who's got a major plant in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Michael Ignatieff's, well, formerly Michael Ignatieff's riding in, the, in Etobicoke Lakeshore uh, riding in Toronto. Laurel Broughton, who is my member of provincial parliament, a liberal member from inside that riding, but also Dalton McGinney. What's this going to mean in terms of, given the conservative uh, success in Ontario, how's this going to carry into the provincial elections? Uh, and number two, what's it mean in Quebec as well? And I'd love to hear from the panelists on that issue. Uh, well, a friend of Scotty's and, and Ian's and mine, Mark Spiro, is the Ontario a campaign manager for Tim Hudak, and he wasn't—he was happy yesterday at the federal success. Uh, he was trying to assess what that would mean uh, for Mr. Hudak, because you can go back. Uh, I think the last time uh, we've ha had a conservative provincial government and a conservative federal government was Mulroney and Davis. That would be right, wouldn't it? Uh, and uh, th there is some concern that uh, that may that for the Tories in Ontario. Um, they, they're, they're, they're uncertain what the federal result means for them. On the surface, you would look and suggest more federal Tories. Maybe there's a tie there, an opportunity that could suggest, and, and the fact that Mr. McGinty is at the end of his term, or end of his third, second term going for his third, uh, that there might be some uh, frustration, which there is. Um, but there's the historical superstitions pervading there, and they are a little uncertain at, at this point as to what it may mean for them and what it may mean in October. It may mean nothing. It may mean something. They're still ahead in the polls there. And I think uh, for you, Kelly, uh, a change provincially is, is not going, certainly won't hinder you. Uh, so there, there is uncertainty, though, about what it means. And I think it'll take a few months to figure out what it means. The other challenge they have, which the Liberals had federally, uh, is the generating the revenue to run a campaign that can win. As soon as that campaign ended federally yesterday, I got a call from them in Ontario asking if we could organize a fundraising reception on June 23rd. I wanted to have somebody do the Osama bin Laden to me. Uh, terrible joke, I know, but I wanted to be shot in the head at that time going out to think that I have to go raise money yet again to do this, but they have some fundraising challenges ahead of them. So McGinty may be advantaged, is the long answer uh, to the question, by having the Prime Minister win. 
I would. I, I think it's. I think it's good for the provincial Liberals in Ontario. I think uh, people in Ontario want a balance. Um, uh, Peterson won when the Harper, when the sort of Mulroney government was in, and I was seen as sort of a balance. Um, I think that um, despite the where the polls are, yeah. I actually think that 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 Hudak's sort of run a campaign so far on on sort of you know attacking McGinty but nobody really knows what he stands for and what he's going to do. And I think they have some internal organization stuff to get sort of straightened out, especially on the money side. The McGinty, the McGinty uh, Liberals are well-funded. Uh, they'll have a good platform. And I just think that, that for Ontarians, it's, uh, you know, you've got, a, you've got uh, Ford, who's the, the mayor of, the, of Toronto, who's sort of right of centre. Uh, you've got a federal government who's right of centre. I think that... Um, that uh, Ontarians will probably re-elect and give McGinty a third term. Just, just one other comment. It's got nothing to do with a friend from Alberta. I think um, one of the unsung heroes, I think, of Mr. Harper's win is Jason Kenney. Mm -hmm. Jason uh, really delivered big time within the ethnic community uh, in the GTA area uh, and, and probably really pushed uh, the Harper team over into, into majority government. So. I don't know if that's a heroic thing. <laughs> that's an unsung hero within the Tory community, would be. Not for you or I. So. Well, I don't know where you're coming from, I, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the kind of divisionary tactics that we saw uh, conservative, um, the Conservative Party play in this election, I think speak a lot to the way that politics are changing. We're not just talking about regional targets. We're not just talking about riding targets. We're talking about targeting people inside riding and the kind of campaigns that they ran in places like Mount Royal I'm not a liberal but I have to say that, that it's pretty shocking I think that uh, David this is now becoming something that we should be pursuing in another yep. seminar that uh, or colloquium that you will have in your program I want to thank everybody for being with us today thank you as well to the Canada Institute and to the Canadian American Business Council uh, particularly thank you for all of your questions and comments. Uh, it led to a much richer discussion. And uh, again, to our panelists, thank you very, very thank much. You, thank Paul. you, Paul.